I know there's been a lot happening, but have you heard that the Supreme Court has made a decision about homosexuality? Now, of course, the Supreme Court of the United States has not yet made that decision. If they had, it will get a lot of attention, won't it? When that comes down, it for sure will get a lot of attention. But have you heard that the Supreme Court has made a decision about homosexuality? The Supreme Court has made a decision, and once it was passed down, it was said that it was not to be amended, it was not to be annulled, it was not to be changed in any way. When the Supreme Court passed down this particular decision, would you believe that the decision was unanimous? There was not a dissenting vote. When the Supreme Court passed down this decision, as is the case often with decisions that come down from the Supreme Court of the United States, when the Supreme Court passed down this decision, the Chief Justice was the one who wrote the opinion about the ruling. And of course, I'm not talking about the Supreme Court of the United States. I am talking about the Supreme Court. I am talking about the Chief Justice. I am talking about the ruling decision, the opinion that he gave on the matter. You know, there are a lot of ways, there are a lot of courts in which judgments are made. A lot of ways people decide things. Some people decide what's right and what's wrong based upon the court of personal opinion. Whatever they feel is right or wrong, that's what's going to be right or wrong for them. Some people decide what's right and wrong based upon the court of public opinion. Whatever seems to be the tide, whatever seems to be the going uh, way to go in our society, we'll just go along with that. And Whatever the court of public opinion says, whatever's popular, then we'll stay with that. There are others who choose to follow after the court of expert opinion. What do the experts say about this? What do those educated individuals say about this? What is it that the scientists are saying about this and they'll follow the court of expert opinion? Some people determine what's right or wrong based upon the court of political opinion. Whatever is politically correct then that's the way that we will go. Some people choose to decide what's right or wrong based upon the court of judicial opinion. What have the courts decided? What is the law of the land? And if there is a certain law that is passed down from the Supreme Court of the United States, does that law then determine what is right and what is wrong? There are others who choose to decide what is right and wrong based upon the court of divine opinion. Based upon the court of heavenly opinion. And who come to the Word of God and simply want to find what the Word of God has to say about a matter. And they will follow that to be truth no matter what. I've spent a long time praying before this lesson this morning. I know that this lesson hits home with a number of people here. And I know that this lesson is not the popular topic to discuss in our society. And perhaps one day there will be ramifications consequences to preachers and churches who allow this topic to be discussed in this type of forum. 
And yet after praying this week, and after recognizing that this would be very uncomfortable for many of you, the truth is that we must stand where the Bible stands. We must speak where the Bible speaks. We must not be ashamed to say what the Bible says. And in case you're here this morning and some of these things may not be certain to you, and in case you are here this morning and and maybe some of these foundational reminders I'm about ready to share with you just briefly are not certain to you, let me, let me just put you at ease this morning and share with you these reminders that whatever the Bible says to us is what God says and not what man says. That when we come to the Bible and see what the Bible says, it's not what the church wants you to believe, it's what heaven wants you to believe. When we come to the Bible, the church has the responsibility to uphold the truth, to stand on the truth, and to present the truth, and no doubt to do so in a loving manner. When we come to the Bible, we need to recognize that it is the final revelation of God. It's it. It is the complete revelation of God. Nothing is yet to be added. Nothing is yet to be changed. Nothing is yet to be taken away from it. It is not a law that can be amended and amended and amended. It is final. When we come to the Bible, we need to remember that we are to respect it as the divine revelation of God. We, to, we are to obey its laws, its teachings, its commandments, its principles, without exception. We need to remember that when we come to the Bible that it is the standard of judgment. There is not another. It is the standard of judgment for all mankind of all time. Jesus said, He who rejects me and receives not my word has that which judges him. The word that I have spoken will judge him in the last day. And we need to understand and we need to remember that as that standard of judgment, that it is the standard upon which our heaven or our hell destiny will be determined. The Bible says in Revelation chapter 20 and verse 12, I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God. And the books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead who were standing there before the judge, the dead were judged by their works according to the things that were written in the books. Where we spend an eternity will be determined by this standard that we look at this morning. And so all I want to do today is just get to the Bible. And I hope you'll get your Bible out. I hope you will go to the passages as we look at them this morning. That's all I want us to do. I'm not here to present my opinion about it because my opinion doesn't matter. We simply want to look at what the Bible says. We're not interested in basing our, our decisions on the court of personal opinion or public opinion or political opinion. Let's just come to the Bible. This morning I just want to share with you five passages, five things that the Bible teaches. This isn't all that the Bible, this isn't all that the Supreme Justice, the Chief Justice, the Supreme Court, is not all that the Bible has to say. But I think after we look at these five things this morning, we will have a rather full understanding of where God comes down on this particular matter. Let's go all the way back to the beginning. Go back in your Bibles to the book of Genesis. Let's start in Genesis chapter 1 and we will work our way through the, the Bible and look at what the Bible says. The first thing we're going to see when we come to the Word of God is that God is the one who created and God is the one who sanctioned the male-female relationship in the beginning. 
On day six of creation in Genesis chapter one and verse 26, the Bible says, Then God said, Let us make man in our image, according to our likeness. Verse 27, God said, So God created man in his own image. And in the image of God, he created man, male and female. He created them. In the very first chapter of our Bible, when the creation of God is described for us, we are specifically told that in God's creation, He created male and female. He created the male-female relationship. And He said to them in verse 28, God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it. When you get to Genesis 2, Genesis 2 expounds upon those verses. Look in verse 18. In Genesis chapter 2 and verse 18, God said it is not good that man should be alone. It is not good that the male should be alone. I will make him a helper comparable to him. When God looked down and saw the male that He had created, before He he had created the counterpart, before He had created the helper, before He had created the one comparable for the male, when He looked down at the male and decided to make someone for the male. In verse 21, He caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and he slept. He took one of his ribs, closed up the flesh in its place. Then the rib which the Lord God had taken from man... He crafted, he formed, and he made into a woman. When God created at the very beginning the human species, he created them male and female. When he created the perfect and only counterpart for that male, He created a woman and he brought her to the man. And the man said, this is now bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman for she was taken out of man. Therefore, in verse 24, the Bible says, a man, a male shall leave his, and don't run over this, shall leave his father and mother. A male-female relationship. When God created this relationship at the very beginning, it was a heterosexual relationship. When He created the first man and gave instructions for this relationship, a man was to leave his father and mother and to be joined unto his woman, unto his wife, and the two to become one flesh. Four thousand some years later, when Jesus was asked, about the marriage relationship. Matthew chapter 19 and verse 4, Jesus said, have you not read? God has already given you the answer. When Jesus talked about the acceptable relationship between individuals in a marriage, Jesus says, you already have the answer. Have you not read? He who made them at the beginning made them male and female. And he said, for this reason, a male shall leave his father and mother, the heterosexual relationship from which he came, shall leave his father and mother and be joined unto his wife. And they too shall become one flesh. Jesus said, you've had the answer all along. And God says to us today, we've had the answer all along. When the Supreme Court passed down their decision, His decision, the Almighty's decision about homosexuality. He told us at the very beginning that it was the male-female relationship that had been created and had been sanctioned by God. Go a little bit later in your book of Genesis. Go to chapter 18. When you go to Genesis chapter 18, we find in this passage the account of Sodom and Gomorrah. Two cities that are very well known in history. Two cities that if you were to ask individuals today if they had heard of them, 
No doubt the average person has heard about Sodom and Gomorrah. If they are not as familiar with Gomorrah, they would be with Sodom because we have a word in the English language that comes from the city of Sodom. The word sodomy in our language that describes the homosexual relationship has as its foundation the name of this city. I wonder why that word is founded upon the name of the city from Genesis chapter 18 and verse 19, and chapter 19. When you get to Genesis chapter 18, it's not the first place that God had talked about the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. Earlier in chapter 13 and verse 13, he had already said that the city of Sodom was wicked and sinful. He'd already said that back in chapter 13, 13. Now he gets to chapter 18 and verse 20, and he says about Sodom and Gomorrah that their sin is very grave. They were wicked and sinful in chapter 13. Their sin is very grave in chapter 18. What's wrong with these cities? You come to chapter 19. And in chapter 19, on the night before these cities were to be destroyed by God, two angels come into these cities. Two angels come into Sodom in chapter 19 and verse 1. And there is Abraham's nephew named Lot, who had gone to live in Sodom. Not a good move on his part. He saw these men come into the city and for their own protection, no doubt, he asked them to come into his home. In verse 4, the Bible says, The men of the city, the males of the city, the males of Sodom, both old and young, all the people from every quarter, surrounded Lot's house. And they called to Lot and they said to him, Where are the males? Where are the men who came to you tonight? Bring them out to us that we may know them, the New King James says, that we may know them carnally. The New American Standard says that we may have relations with them. And if those two translations are not clear enough for you, the NIV says bring them out to us that we may have sex with them. What was so wicked, chapter 13 and verse 13? What was so very grave, chapter 18 and verse 20, about the sin of these cities? You just got a taste of it. Bring them out, these two men that have just come into your home. Bring them out to us that we may have sex with them. Lot went out to them through the doorway, shut the door behind them and said, please, my brethren, do not do so wickedly. When you go over to the New Testament and you look at what the New Testament has to say about this particular occasion, in Jude, little book of Jude in verse 7, as God tries to remind individuals about the seriousness of His judgment, In Jude verse 7, he reminds them of Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities around them. In a similar manner to these, having given themselves over to sexual immorality and gone after strange flesh. The ESV says they have gone after an unnatural desire. They are set forth as an example suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. 2 Peter chapter 2, the Bible says much the same thing that Lot was living in that city. Verse 7, oppressed by the sensual conduct of the inhabitants. We've only looked in two places in our Bible. We've already seen that when God created man in the beginning, He sanctioned the male-female relationship. And we are only in, I'm on page 14 of my Bible, we're only on the 14th page of the Bible and we already see God destroying multiple cities because they had given themselves over to homosexuality. Go to the book of Leviticus, the third book of your Bible. In Leviticus chapter 18, and we'll just see two verses over in the book of Leviticus. And what we find in the book of Leviticus is God speaking very directly about this particular sin. Leviticus chapter 18 and verse 22. God says, You shall not lie with a male as with a woman. It is 
an abomination. In chapter 20 and verse 13, Leviticus chapter 20 and verse 13, If a man lies with a male as he lies with a woman, both of them have committed an abomination. When God looked down at this activity, in chapter 13 and verse 13 of the book of Genesis, He called it wicked. Chapter 18 and verse 20, He called it very grave. When Lot came out and told the men of the city, do not do so wickedly against these men. Now you get to the book of Leviticus and it calls it an abomination. Something that God, an activity that God abhors. There are some who look at these passages and say, but that's all in the Old Testament. There's some who recognize that we're not bound by the law of the Old Testament any longer. We live under the New Testament. The old law was nailed to the cross in Colossians 2 and verse 14. So we're not bound by the laws that are found in the Old Testament. We're not bound by these things, even in the book of Leviticus. While we're not bound by the old law, if we come to the New Testament, If we come to the new law and find the exact same thing said in the new law, what happens is that the two compound together and fortify together and make even stronger together the argument against this lifestyle. Go to the book of Romans in your New Testament to what is perhaps the most Graphic, what is perhaps the most detrimental argument against the homosexual lifestyle? You go to Romans chapter 1, and what we're going to see in Romans chapter 1 is that God clearly condemns all homosexual activity as sin. We know Romans 1 and verse 16. Let's start there. We know Romans 1 and verse 16 where where Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It is the power of God unto salvation. Paul says, here's the gospel of Christ. It's the power of God unto salvation. In verse 17, he says, for in it, in the gospel, in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed. Paul says, here's the gospel. Here's the gospel that saves us. And inside the gospel is the righteousness of God revealed to us. Now look at the very next verse. Because then he changes. In the gospel is presented unto us the righteousness of God. For the wrath of God, in verse 18, is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness. In the gospel, God tells us what's right. And then he goes on to tell us if we don't follow that righteousness, then the wrath of God is revealed against those who would not follow it. Drop down in this chapter to verse 24. Therefore God also gave them up to uncleanness or impurity in the lust of their hearts to dishonor their bodies among themselves, who exchanged the truth of God for the lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the Creator. Do you remember from Genesis chapter 1 and 2? The Creator. Do you remember how the Creator made the human race? Do you remember how God created and sanctioned the male-female relationship? Here were some who were worshiping the creature rather than worshiping the Creator and the way He had created man to live. Now look at verse 26. For this reason, God gave them up to vile passions. That's God's evaluation of homosexuality. For even their women exchanged the natural use for what is against nature. If you have the uh, New American Standard, instead of the word use, you will have they exchanged the natural function. For what is against nature. If you have the ESV, it'll have the word there that they exchanged the natural uh, relations for what is against nature. Here were women who, against nature, well, what was nature? 
Nature was the way God made them. Romans chapter 1 and verse 26, coupled with Genesis 1 and chapter 2, will not allow someone to say, I was born this way. God just said it's against nature. It's against the way they were created in verse 25. It's against the way they were made in verse 26. And they were exchanging the natural use, functions, relations of a male-female relationship. In verse 26, it was woman for woman. In verse 27, likewise also the men, leaving the natural use or function or relations of the woman, burned in their lust for one another, men with men committing what is... How does God evaluate this? Shameful. Receiving in themselves the penalty. How does God evaluate this? Of their error which was due. Let me remind you that I have not set out on a course this morning in some hateful manner to explain to you my position, to explain to you what the church believes or teaches about this. All we're doing this morning is looking at what the Bible says. All we've looked at this morning are verses in God's Word and words in God's Word that God put in the Bible. Man didn't put them there. That God put in the Bible to describe this type of a relationship. And down in verse 32, he says, Knowing that the righteous judgment of God, that those who practice such things are deserving of death. Spiritual, eternal. Romans chapter 6 verse 23 says, The wages of sin is death, not physical death. We're talking about a spiritual death. We're talking about an eternal death. We're talking about a separation from God that takes place in these activities. It's the way the God of heaven describes this. Let's look at one other passage in the New Testament in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Look over in 1 Corinthians chapter 6 where we see that God announces the eternal punishment For those who are engaged in homosexuality. 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 9, the Bible says, Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Here's the kingdom of God. Here's the inheritance that God wants all men to have. He doesn't want anybody to perish. He wants all to be saved and come to repentance. He wants every creature on earth to have this inheritance. But he says in this passage, the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God. And the word unrighteous should be enough for us. Because the word unrighteous describes for us those in a general way that do not follow the principles and the laws that are laid out in the word of God. But then he gives us some examples. In verse 9 he says, Do not be deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. How interesting that nowhere else in the Bible does God use two different words to describe Right back to back, the homosexual relationship. Homosexuals and sodomites. It does not matter how someone views the homosexual relationship. God used both words that could describe that relationship. And he says they are both equally guilty in that activity. You may not have the words homosexuals or sodomites. You may have or perhaps have looked at uh, the NIV that ends this verse instead of the word homosexuals and sodomites that just says men who have sex with men. God doesn't have to get any plainer, does he? And he says here is the eternal punishment. Now it doesn't have to be that way. 
it is given to those who are unrighteous, but it doesn't have to be that way. He says in verse 11, and such were some of you. He's writing to Christians that this is where they used to be. This was a lifestyle they used to engage in, but he said, they're no longer there. It's not a part of them anymore. If they had stayed there, then then those verses 9 and 10 would apply to them. But because they had given it up, they were talked about in verse 11, having been washed, having been sanctified, having been justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of God. I want you to see by way of summary that without exception in our Bibles, and there is no exception, without exception in our Bibles, every mention of homosexuality is either a prohibition or a condemnation from God. There is not a single word in the Bible that does not fall into one of those two categories on God's evaluation of this particular choice, of this particular decision, of this particular route that someone may make for their life. I present this this morning with no great joy or excitement in my heart to talk about it other than to know that the Bible tells us that we must not shun to present the whole counsel of God. That we must not be ashamed of what the Word of God says. But if any man speaks, he needs to speak as the oracles of God. Let me share one other thing with you. A bonus, you might say. We said we'd have five things to look at in the Bible. But let me just share one other thing with you from the Word of God. While God has everything to say in His Word by way of prohibition or condemnation against the homosexual lifestyle, and while we're not interested in approaching this from the court of public opinion or personal opinion, we're just trying to look at at God's standard of judgment, don't you know that the God we serve still offers hope to people who are in sin. Now, now this, these points that we're going to talk about for just a minute apply to anyone. Apply to anyone in any situation in life. We are applying them specifically at this point to those who may be right now engaged in or may be struggling with Homosexual, homosexuality. But I want you to know this applies to everybody. But I want you to see how the God of heaven, while he has nothing positive, but all prohibition and condemnation against homosexuality, yet the God of hope gives hope. God's gospel, if we will allow it into our hearts, will transform us from within. Somebody truly can be transformed if they allow the Word of God to get into their hearts. That doesn't mean it's going to be easy. God never said that was going to be easy. That goes right along with the second point, and that is that God's mercy, God's mercy gives us an opportunity to repent. Some people, that that doesn't make sense. They they say, what do you mean? He he gives us an opportunity to repent. That's how the Bible phrases it. In Acts 5, 31, Acts 11, 18, to the Jews first and then to the Gentiles in Acts 11, the Bible says God gave them the gift of repentance. Here were people living in sin and God gave them an opportunity to change. He didn't have to do that. But here's a God who's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And so He has given everyone through His mercy an opportunity to change their mind. And that's what repentance is, to say, I don't want to live this way anymore. I don't want to do this anymore. And to allow His powerful gospel, His Word that's living and active, to get into their hearts and to transform them from within. 
God's grace is that which provides a way of escape for those who are struggling in temptation. Don't you know that God didn't have to provide a way of escape? But in 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 13, he says, He will provide if we are looking for it and if we want it. He will provide that way of escape. There is a way to get out of temptation. And again, that doesn't mean it's going to be easy. Repentance is not easy. Fleeing from temptation is not always easy. But 1 Corinthians 6 and verse 18, that's what it tells us to do. Flee sexual immorality. Flee fornication. Fornication, sexual immorality is the broader term, the larger word that encompasses all sexual uh, activities, all illicit sexual activities that includes homosexuality. So in effect, God says in 1 Corinthians 6 verse 18, flee homosexuality. Flee sexual immorality. Get away from it. He gives us the opportunity to get away from it. And then he says, here's how you do it. When you pray, pray, Father, deliver me not into temptation. Didn't Jesus say, watch and pray lest you enter into temptation? Do you believe that God can help you? God's power can help you. God's power, as we saw in 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 11, God's power can transform you. God's power can change your identity. I want you to think of 1 Corinthians chapter 6 about how their identity was changed. In 1 Corinthians 6, they were idolaters, adulterers, homosexuals, sodomites. That's who they were. That's how they were identified. But verse 11 says, such were some of you. You are not that anymore. Well, what am I now? 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 18 and 19, God says, you are the temple of the Holy Spirit who's in you. God can change your identity if you want Him to, if you let Him. And His love His love will forgive anyone of their sins if they are willing to turn away from them. And God's love will give that inheritance even to someone who in this life struggled with homosexual cravings and desires. They give themselves over to the Lord and they fight those temptations even God's love, and give to them His inheritance. And again, these things apply to anyone struggling with any sin in their life. May God help us. May God help us to be the kind of people He wants us to be. May God help us to be a loving people. A people who love God a people who love His Word, and a people who love people. Enough to help them. Enough to help them to get to heaven. Have you heard? The Supreme Court issued a decision about homosexuality. When that decision was given, it was never to be amended never to be reversed, never to be revoked. When it was given, it was passed in heaven unanimously. And the chief justice himself wrote the opinion about it. May God help us to turn to His Word, to speak the truth, and make sure that we speak the truth in love. In the same manner this morning, the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court has made a decision about the plan of salvation. At every service of the church here, we offer the Lord's invitation. It's not ours. It belongs to Him. He extends it to every individual on this earth because He wants every individual to be saved. And He's told us in His Word what we must do in order to be saved. He's told us we need to believe 
with all of our heart that Jesus is the Son of God. The evidence for that is overwhelming and unanswerable. That He is the Son of God. Thank you, Johnny Davis, for taking us back to the cross this morning. Reminding us of what Jesus did for us. What He bore in the blood that He shed for our sins. And He died and they put Him in that tomb and He rose the third day. Do you believe that He did that? If you believe that He did that, why would you want your sins anymore? The Bible says in order to be saved, to repent, to turn away from your sins. Say, I don't want to live in sin anymore. I want to get rid of those sins. And with your mouth confess the faith that's deep in your heart. I believe that Jesus is the Son of God. And to do exactly what they did in the Bible. To be immersed into Christ. Be baptized into Christ. Jesus shed His blood upon the cross. And the place that we reach that blood is when we are baptized into His death. Romans 6 verses 3 and 4. Buried with Him in baptism. His blood will wash away every one of your sins. The chief justice is the one who's going to take care of your sins. The chief justice is the one who's going to add you to his church. The chief justice is the one who's going to write your name in the book of life. And then all he asks you to do is to pick up his law, to pick up his ruling, to pick up his word, and to walk by it every day. To walk in the light as he is in the light, and he'll keep on forgiving you as you keep on serving him. If this church can help you in your walk with the Lord, if this church can help you to make sure that you're on the path to go to heaven, and come right now as together we stand and sing.